Ron Beal, a soldier with the Royal Regiment of Canada, saw the worst slaughter of all before capture, the flank landing at Puy. Almost all who landed were casualties. The regiment wiped out. On the way in, the ramp on the assault landing craft goes down, and you're, you're looking out, and you can see the small arms fire hitting the water just like rain. When we touch the beach, you hear the sound of the craft touching the beach, and everybody moves. We felt that when we got to the seawall, we'd have some form of protection. We could regroup and carry on from there. But when we got to the seawall, we were taking fire from behind, and we didn't know where it was coming from. And you're sort of at a loss, you know, what do we do now? And just about that time, our platoon sergeant came down and said, keep your heads down. These so-and-sos are playing for keeps. And we were literally trapped. There was nothing we could do. We couldn't go forward. We couldn't go backward. We were absolutely trapped. It was a feeling of absolute hopelessness. The fire that we took was absolutely incredible. You couldn't believe that there could be that much uh, coming at you. There's a pillbox up on the cliff, which was shooting right down on our backs. The only protection we had were the sort of supports that are leaning out from the, the seawall itself. and. If you got on one side, you were exposed to the one gun. If you got on the other side, you were exposed to the other gun. It didn't matter which side you got onto, you were taking fire from right and left flank and to your rear. So that the situation was totally impossible. Denny Whitaker was one of a handful to actually reach the city. He gained fame by leading a wild charge through Dieppe's casino and beyond. And then back again, miraculously unhurt. So to the right, about 50 or 75 yards, was the casino. So I decided uh, that's the way to go. So I said to my men, uh, follow me, we'll make for the casino. Uh, we got to the uh, casino entrance. It was uh, wired and we couldn't get through, but we did have wire cutters and we cut our way uh, in and went in with our Sten guns and uh, rifles firing. There were a lot of Germans uh, in the casino on the main uh, main floor. On the uh, they were upstairs. Uh, they were everywhere. So there was a real dogfight that went on for some some time uh, before we were able to clear them out. Uh, the objective. There was one company who was supposed to land and immediately climb up there and take the castle. Well, there was no way they were going to be able to do it. It was impossible. The objectives were uh, far, far too optimistic. They, five times the number of troops couldn't accomplish what we were supposed to accomplish. Completely exposed, Ron Beale had to play dead for two and a half hours while thousands of German rounds whistled past him the slightest movement meant down. You just stayed motionless, absolutely motionless. You didn't reach for a cigarette, you didn't turn your head, you didn't talk to the chap next to you. The, I think the main thing that ran through my mind was I would rather die here than go home a total cripple and useless. And I think I said a prayer to that effect, please don't let them make a cripple of me. I would rather die. And uh, I think maybe a lot of our boys did the same thing. And fortunately, uh, I never became a cripple and I didn't die. I survived and I, as far as I'm concerned, it's an absolute miracle that anybody ever walked off this beach. After the battle, Archie Anderson would stagger for hours across the beach, carrying the wounded and the dying from the shoreline, faces that still haunt him. And as, I, as the afternoon proceeded, I continued to come back down, carrying wounded. And by the time I finished with the, the one I was satisfied with, the last wounded man on there, I came to pick him up. He had lost both legs completely. And he asked me to just leave him where he was, not to bother picking him up. So I said, well, my mother always said, where there's life, there's hope, so we've got to try. And I took him by the wrist and slung him over my shoulders and 
I couldn't believe how light he was. He had lost so much and started back through the, the water again. And by that time, there were so many bodies in the water, it was virtually impossible for me to step between the bodies as I carried him. It was just so tiring that every trip seemed like it had to be the last. But every trip showed that it couldn't be the last. I had to go back. And well, the worst thing that happened to me in the water was uh, when the boat was, the ALC was, uh, had, was moving out to sea. There was a fellow in the water named Rieger who was in my platoon. I reached down, he held his hand up, and I reached down and grabbed his hand and tried to hold him and pull him into the water. I tried to get the boatman to yell at him, slow down, but he wouldn't. And uh, I, uh, I couldn't hold him. And eventually he slipped from my grasp, and uh, I tried to get the, the boatsman to go back. He wouldn't do it. And, uh, so I, it was a terrible moment for me. The nightmarish was the noise, the, the, the explosion of grenades, the explosion of mortar bombs, the explosion of shells, the flying stone, the flying shrapnel, uh, men being hit and screaming, some men calling for their mothers, other men uh, sitting on the beach trying to tuck their innards in, uh, bodies without heads, bodies without arms, and the, the smell, the horrible, horrible smell of cordite and, and death. And that's the kind of thing that stays with you. When, you. when you have your nightmares, you wake up through the night and you, it's, it's in your nostrils. I'm sorry. It's, uh, okay, then. You, you can almost smell it in your sleep. And it wakes you out of a dead sleep. You can hear the noise. You can you have the sensation of that smell. And if it wasn't for you, the wife laying beside you to, to comfort you, you would be an absolute basket case. It's very vivid. I, I can remember everything that happened. I mean, there are lots of things during the war are complete blank, but I, I, I certainly remember this action vividly. It's Almost every minute of it. It was so awful that day that some veterans have never come back never want to come back and i know that you didn't come back until today do you think it's good now that you've come back has it has it changed things a bit to come back i think it has i think it has we, we've come back and found happy civilians i felt i guess i felt it was my duty to come back and Tell what I saw. If it'll do any good, I'm happy. It's a great relief to see it peaceful, and yet it's hard to imagine that they're not still here. You would have thought that it would ease with years, but it doesn't seem to. It doesn't, no. No, it doesn't, and it's... Now, uh, they're beginning to recognize, when I say they, the medical and uh, psychological and psychi psych psychiatrists are beginning to recognize that this is a post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, we're now in the process of uh, approaching the government to get some compensation or some form of recognition as a pensionable disability for post-traumatic stress. Any final thoughts before we close down, looking now that you visit the beach? Uh, yes, I wish it had never, ever happened. And I hope and pray that it'll never, ever happen again and none of the young people in any generation will ever have to face what we faced here. When we return, our three veterans consider the legacy of Dieppe and how they've tried to make peace with memories of it. Je m'appelle Simone Prieur. 
et euh, j'habite à Dieppe depuis toujours, puisque je suis née à 